Traces based on bite marks can be really, really hard to study because not everyone always documents whether or not they're there. For example, in the Morrison Formation, one of the most famous formations of dinosaur-bearing rocks, there's tons of fossils, but no one's really looked in great detail at what kind of bite marks are on most of the fossils throughout the entire formation. There's a few isolated places like the Migate Moor Quarry, where they've gone through and actually looked at that in great detail, but that is just one of many quarries containing a lot of dinosaurs. With that said though, there's finally been a study doing this that looked at a bunch of the fossils coming from the Morris information and were able to look at where different bites are, at least on sauropod bones. And they found a decent number, but not as high of a number as you might expect from other environments. This is especially true when you compare it to things like Tyrannosaur-based environments, especially Tyrannosaurus rex, where there's been a ton of this kind of study. But that's also because basically every bone that was at the surface for any prolonged period of time has some level of Tyrannosaurus rex or similar animal biting into it, because Tyrannosaur teeth were just better designed for this. They had flat backed teeth at the front of their jaws in order to scrape off certain parts of meat from the bone, and those would still leave scratches on those bones. Meanwhile, the four large theropods that would have been present in the Morrison formation really didn't have that same kind of tooth. Instead, they had more thin, blade-like teeth for cutting into meat, and they still scratched bone, but between Torvosaurus, Allosaurus, Sauropheganax, and Ceratosaurus, it doesn't seem like they were as built for biting into bone as things like Tyrannosaurus rex, which lived much, much later. For the specific numbers in the Morrison Formation, they had 68 bones that were actually bitten out of a sample of over 600. So you can really see from there, it's not nearly as significant as you would find in a Tyrannosaur-based environment. Still, these bites can actually tell us some things about how these animals might have behaved. For example, when you see one of the lower leg bones that they used in this study that was bitten near the top of it, it's really unlikely that this animal was entirely put together, or at least the animal that was getting eaten was entirely put together. And that's because you would probably need that entire upper portion of the limb to be gone in order to actually get a bite onto those lower leg bones in that position. And there's a few other bite marks that are like this. If you're chewing on one end of a femur, that means you're missing all of the meat that would have been covering that end of the femur. This could imply one of two things. Either first, it could imply that these predators actually took down this large sauropod and then were feeding on it for a very long period of time, or alternatively, it was scavenging behavior and they were just chewing on what was left. Both of those are equally likely. And it's really important with these kinds of studies, and this paper does mention that, there are going to be some biases in here. Because potentially you could have something where, yeah, it bit off the end of the tail of a dinosaur and bites off the whole end of the tail. These are large predators, like Allosaurus. It's over 30 feet longer, around 10 meters. It would just swallow the tip of that tail whole. Or like is potentially even more likely, since the adult sauropods were so large, these animals were probably targeting a lot of juveniles and even other smaller dinosaurs in the environment, such as things like Camptosaurus. What we do know about those animals is, first, from the bite marks on adult sauropods, Allosaurus or other large predators could probably bite through thick bones of the ribs in adult sauropods. Those adult sauropod ribs are about as thick as the largest femur bones in some juvenile sauropods, meaning it's just gonna eat the whole thing. There's no reason for them to stop and pause and be like, okay, we're gonna leave all of these nice bones full of marrow in order for paleontologists to find in the future. No, they're just gonna eat the whole thing. There's no reason for them not to. It's also important to consider that there would have been a lot of juvenile dinosaurs around, especially sauropods. We have fossilized sauropod nests, and it seems like they just kind of did this thing where they'd dump a ton of eggs in, kind of like sea turtles do, and then just let them go off, and maybe one or two survive to adulthood. What that also means then is that when you're looking at the sauropod environment, you need to understand the fossil bias. Larger animals are going to get preserved easier because they're more likely to be complete. If it dies and gets eaten, that fossil is gone. Meanwhile, if it lives to adulthood and then dies and one leg bone gets buried, hey, we have a fossil. So there is biases both in what these predators are doing in hunting and in the fossil record and what gets preserved. So there's a lot of biases you need to be considerate of when studying these kinds of fossils. The authors also looked at where the teeth marks were and how they were spaced to see if they could understand how the different theropod dinosaurs may have actually differed in their feeding preferences. And what they found is it's really hard to know which ones actually fed on what. The spacing is close enough and it can be very easily altered. For example, if an Allosaurus and a Sauropheganax have fairly similar tooth patterns, but there's enough difference you can tell just from looking at the fossils themselves, 
All it takes is for that Allosaurus to have a slightly loose tooth on one day when it bit that bone, and it's going to mess up the entire bite pattern. So it's really, really hard to try and narrow down which organisms actually made these bites, as opposed to when you're looking at Tyrannosaur-dominated environments where, in general, the Tyrannosaurs were the only large predators around. What this all means is there's not any really concrete conclusions from the paper. However, it's important to still do these kinds of studies because it's laying the groundwork. Nobody else can go out and study all of these bite marks if they don't know they're there. So this kind of publication is more about informing, hey, this is what we have and someone could do something with it, but we just don't know what that is yet. So hopefully somebody will start researching some of these bite marks a little bit more and come to some reasonable conclusions as opposed to a separate paper that also came out last month that was also about allosaur feeding in the Morrison Formation. The authors on the second paper actually a few years ago proposed that allosaurs were just apex scavengers. All they did was scavenge. And they did this by throwing some numbers into a system and going, yeah, look, there would have been plenty of adult dead sauropods hanging around for them to feed on. Plus also, you know, they probably would have died one out of every 10 times hunting sauropods, ignoring the fact that there's plenty of other things for them to hunt. So what that means is their fundamental premise was flawed, and they basically use those same numbers in this study as well, which if you're using a flawed premise to try and prove something different, that is still going to be a flawed premise. They do mention in the paper some of the biases that could be present just in the predators, which are things like the differences between hunting in different sexes of the dinosaur, as well as potentially different times of the season where they could have been going after different prey items or scavenging different things. The problem is, they're still ignoring that large portion of that bias that the first paper mentions. If they hunt a small dinosaur, that dinosaur is getting eaten. There's not any bones left to study, which means we're missing this very large sample of what these animals were probably doing, and we need to understand that when we're writing papers. It's a great dichotomy of how you can do something very thoroughly and still not have any conclusions versus doing something that's ignoring part of the problem and coming up to a conclusion. And hopefully we'll get more people trying to research different parts of how these ecosystems worked so we can come to a better conclusion about the Morrison formation.